Peace and Black Power, Mighty Africans. This is McConan Tendaji, the Political Education Director for the African Black Coalition. This is PE with ABC, Peace and Black Power to you all. On this episode, we are discussing and analyzing revolutionary theory in the words of our ancestor, Emil Carr Cabral. If it is true that a revolution can fail, even though it be nurtured on perfectly conceived theories, nobody has yet successfully practiced revolution without a revolutionary theory. The reason why we are covering this topic in this episode of PE with ABC is because the African Black Coalition believes that it is of paramount importance that any organization that is doing the work of of African liberation has uh, solid and and tested revolutionary theory that that has been produced as a result of rigorous study and scholarship both in the in a theoretical and, and um, ideological sense, as well as a practical and and um, tried and tested application, right? And we're gonna just explore what that means. And, and again, in, in the the words of another ancestor, one of the the greatest Kwame Ture, he says that revolution is a science, and we must be precise. We should at all times avoid any discourse around ah. Oh, we spend too much time reading or, you know, we, we do too much talking and not enough acting. We, we need to be clear that no amount of organizing or putting on community programs or anything like that will give us that necessary push forward, will, will bring us any closer to our freedom if those actions and if those things are not grounded in constructive and revolutionary theory, right, based, based in firm ideological principles and values. So we're going to just cover a few of those in this lesson. Um, so we're going to discuss some important terms, and then we're going to do some specific analysis of some revolutionary theoretical texts. We have The Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, Volume 1. We have The Wretched of the Earth by the great theorist Frantz Fanon. We have the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare by the first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. Then we have Blood in My Eye by the revolutionary theorist and co-founder of the Black Guerrilla family, George Jackson. And and you can see, based on the years of publication for each of these texts, right, we are are spanning just about the entirety of the 20th century. And it's going to be critical that we are aware of that so that we can understand that what we are struggling for and what we are fighting for today is not far off from what was being struggled for and fought for the past generation and the generation before that, right? We, we are grounded in a very rich and in a, in, in a very um, um, vast Black radical tradition. By no means is what we are, is what we are doing today brand new, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a, an old adage that there's nothing new under the sun. And that's okay, right? We, we aren't necessarily in this to discover some brand new idea. It, it doesn't exist, right? So coming to terms with that, we can then begin to humbly and constructively study the theory and the work of those who came before us, right? The blueprint has been laid essentially in what we need to do as revolutionary Africans contemporarily is right study the, the the past work right learn from the mistakes pick up off the strengths all those different things need to be incorporated and, and fueled right into our our current struggles so some important terms we have theory theory is defined as a belief policy or procedure proposed or followed as the basis of action then we have ideology a manner or the contents of thinking characteristics of an individual group or culture, the integrated assertions, theories, and aims that constitute a socio-political program, a systematic body of concepts, especially about human life or culture. Then we have practice, the actual application or use of an idea, belief, or method, as opposed to theories relating to it. Now, these three terms are very, very critical, not just in this, this analysis of evolutionary theory, but they are critical for us to be able to understand and incorporate in our discourse today, right? O- oftentimes, um, when the point is raised of, 
we spend too much time reading, we spend too much time studying that theory that 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 is being raised in that point, and the the lack of practice is the the basis of that argument, right? And then you have the flip, you know, the the, the flip side um, of that argument. Some will say we we don't do enough studying, we we do too much acting and reacting, and and not enough, you know, grounding ourselves in study. That's the argument of too much practice and not enough theory, right? What we need to strive to achieve is a synthesis, right? Or a, or a merge in theory and practice, right? We need to do the best that we can and, and attain and sustain a balance between theory and practice, right? And, and we can think of these three terms as representing a, um, a, a a structure of source, right? Where the ideology is the foundation, right? And then we can think of theory and practice as different rooms within this structure, right? So th there is no constructive basis to any organization or to any, any system or structure without ideology. And then if there is too much theory and not enough practice, you have an, an, an imbalance, right, in the structure, and if, you, if there's too much practice and not enough theory, you also have an imbalance in the structure. So again, we should strive as best as we can to maintain a balance between theory and practice. So let's move to our first um, text that we're going to analyze, The Philosophy and Opinions of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Volume 1. Coincidentally, not coincidentally, actually, it, it's, it's by divine ancestral timing that we are analyzing this text on the born day of our ancestor, the greatest Pan-African leader, the Honorable Marcus Garvey. This text was actually published by Amy Jacques Garvey, his second wife, um, in 1923. And listen to what Amy Garvey has to say about the reason why she chose to publish this work. She says that, I decided to publish this volume in order to give to the public an opportunity of studying and forming an opinion of him, him being Marcus Garvey, not from inflated and misleading newspaper and magazine articles, but from expressions of thoughts enunciated by him in defense of his oppressed and struggling race, so that by his own words he may be judged, and Negroes the world over may be informed and inspired for truth brought to light forces conviction, and a state of conviction inspires action. By no means was Amy Garvey, just the wife of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Amy Garvey was absolutely a fierce and, and bold African revolutionary in every sense of the word, right? I would highly encourage those of us who are tuning in to do thorough research on our sister because the, the contributions uh, of her cannot go uh, uh, understated, right? So we're just gonna analyze just some statements and some excerpts from this book. Um, just to be able to, to do a real fundamental analysis of this work. So the Honorable Marcus Garvey writes, all of us may not live to see the higher accomplishments of an African empire so strong and powerful as to compel the rest of mankind, but we in our lifetime can so work and act as to make the dream a possibility within another generation. Action, self-reliance, the vision of self and the future have been the only means by which the oppressed have seen and realized the light of their own freedom. History is the landmark by which we are directed into the true course of life. In just these three excerpts alone, I believe that, that the Honorable Marcus Garvey is brilliantly articulating the necessity for, as we discussed earlier, the, the need to sustain a balance between theory and practice. So take this second excerpt, for instance, he says, action, self-reliance, the vision of self and the future, right? Those three things right there. We can argue that action represents the practice, right? As does self-reliance. The vision of self and the future can represent theory, right? And, and what does he say of these things? He says that these things are the only means by which the oppressed have seen and realized the light of their own freedom. And then this third excerpt here, he says that history is the landmark by which we are directed into the true course of life arguing that no organization, no structure, no group of people can make any sort of constructive gains in the name of a, of a race or in the name of a, of a cause without doing proper, rigorous, constant analysis of history, right? He says that history directs us into the true course of life, right? And then he also um, articulates 
a few critical points on this idea of force. He says that the powers opposed to Negro progress will not be influenced in the slightest by mere verbal protests on our part. They realize only too well that protests of this kind contain nothing but the breath expended in making them. The pressure, of course, may assert itself in other forms, but in the last analysis, whatever influence is brought to bear against the powers opposed to Negro progress must contain the element of force in order to accomplish its purpose, since it is apparent that this is the only element they recognize. For us to break this down and really critically analyze what's being said, we can see clearly in the year 1923, or at least when this is published, right, the Honorable Marcus Garvey is articulating the need for violence, the, the, the historical and scientific necessity, right, of revolutionary violence and action and self-defense. He says it, right? He says, the powers opposed to our progress will not be influenced in the slightest by mere verbal protest on our part, right? He goes on to say, whatever influence is brought to bear against these powers, right, that are opposed to our progress must contain the element of force. Remember, the Honorable Marcus Garvey is, is a prominent leader in the early 20th century, the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. This is over just around 100 years ago, right, 80, 90, 100 years ago, and he's articulating this need, right, the necessity for revolutionary violence. We cannot overstate that. We cannot obscure that in our study of our people and of our black radical tradition. Then he also speaks on um, traitors, right? He says that in the fight to reach the top, the oppressed have always been encumbered by the traitors of their own race, made up of those of little faith and those who are generally susceptible to bribery for the selling out of the rights of their own people. The traitors among the Negro race are generally to be found among the men highest placed in education and society, the fellows who call themselves leaders. The Honorable Marcus Garvey, one could argue, was certainly um, a, a prophet of his time, particularly in the area of, of philosophizing and theorizing the conditions of the masses of Black people, right, uh, of African people. He, in the early 20th century, is articulating concepts that can be directly applied to today. If we were to remove the title of these excerpts and just read them contemporarily, I would argue that, that we would come to a, a, a belief that, oh, this must have been written this year, or this must have been written in, in the past two or three years, right? This just goes to show the true timelessness uh, of the, the scholarship and the mind of someone as revolutionary as the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And then in the year 1922, he actually articulates the true solution of the Negro problem, right? And, and this, is, this is his analysis on essentially how the masses of African people were, were found themselves in the condition that they found themselves in. He says that as far as Negroes are concerned in America, we have the problem of lynching, peonage, and disenfranchising. In the West Indies, South and Central America, we have the problem of peonage, serfdom industrial and political governmental inequality. In Africa, we have not only peonage and serfdom, but outright slavery, racial exploitation, and alien political monopoly. What's critical about this excerpt is there's never a failure or a, 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 an obscurity, right, of the global presence of African Black people. And we say this in, in all of our PU and ABC programming that we need to be sure whenever we are engaging in study, whenever we are engaging in dialogue, whenever we are engaging in community programs or projects that we maintain a global sense of African Black people, that we are doing what we are doing for all Black people, all African people around the world, and that Black people in, in the United States are not the only Black people in the world, right? What the Honorable Marcus Garvey is articulating here is the, the different, the, the unique problems and conditions, right, that are inflicted upon African people in America, in the West Indies, in South America, Central America, and on the continent. Again, the years 1922, almost 100 years ago. And what you have here is a, is a brilliant demonstration, right, of this global consciousness. He goes on, he, the Negro, cannot resort to the government for protection, for government will be in the hands of the majority of the people who are prejudiced against him. Hence, for the Negro to depend on the ballot and his industrial progress alone will be hopeless as it does not help him when he is lynched, burned, Jim Crowed, and segregated. 
The future of the Negro, therefore, outside Africa, spells ruin and disaster. Again, he is, he is articulating not only the importance to um, scrutinize and, and, and criticize, right, the, the um, machinations of the um, colonizers' institutions and infrastructures by saying the Negro cannot only depend upon the dollar and his industrial progress alone. He is actually articulating the, 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 the need, right, to maintain that, that scrutiny, to maintain that, that criticism of the government, right? He goes on, we cannot allow a continuation of these crimes against our race as 400 million men, women, and children worthy of the existence given us by the divine creator. We are determined to solve our own problem by redeeming our motherland, Africa, from the hands of alien exploiters and found there a government, a nation of our own, strong enough to lend protection to the members of our race scattered all over the world and to compel the respect of the nations and races of the earth. Now he, in this particular um, section of the, of the text, he is speaking on um, the ways in which political participation, and when we say political participation, we mean the participation within the electoral political realm, right, of the United States. He says, this opened up to the eyes of the white nation in these United States of America, the possibility of the black man making laws to govern the white man this possibility drove them to almost madness. A determination was arrived at that never again would it be possible for the race of slaves to govern the race of masters. There is not one instance where a slave race living in the same country within the same bounds as the race of masters that enslaved them and being in numbers less than the race of masters has ever yet ruled and governed the masters. It has never been so in history and it will never be so in the future. This particular time period to, to which Marcus Garvey is, is analyzing is the the period that we can consider uh, the reconstruction period right the 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 decades immediately following right the the emancipation um or the supposed emancipation right of enslaved africans there was a a surge in the election of formerly enslaved african people to political offices right you had a uh and an, an unprecedented boost in the representation within the electoral political realm of black people. And what he says here is that the, the possibility, right, that key possibility of the black man making laws to govern the white man was one that the powers that be at the time could not um, fathom truthfully. And so from this uh, sort of slippage in the uh, governing of the land, right? He says that, that a determination was arrived at. Never again would it be possible for the race of slaves to govern the race of masters. And just to, just to, to really emphasize this third excerpt here, he says that there is not one instance where a slave race living in the same country has ever yet ruled and governed the masters. It has never been so in history and it never will be so in the future. I really would, would, would urge us to sit with this particular excerpt, especially around this time of the year with the, the um, electoral political realm in full force in terms of its propaganda, in terms of its um, spreading of, of misinformation and of uh, messaging right to participate within that realm um, here in the United States. I would really like us to just think critically, right, with what the Honorable Marcus Garvey is saying here, because we, we we cannot overlook it and continue to blindly participate and, and ignorantly um, throw ourselves at the whims of elected officials and those who are running for, for public office simply because it's what everybody's doing, right? There, there needs to be room made for critical thinking, for scrutiny, right? Donald Marcus Garvey goes on. So for us to encourage the idea that one day Negroes will rise to the highest in the administration of this white government is only encouraging a vain hope. The only wise thing for us as ambitious Negroes to do is to organize the world over and build up for the race, a mighty nation of our own in Africa. Now, with this first um, excerpt, I know some of us will, will see that and respond, well, you know, um, 
the United States actually elected a, a you know its first black president. Um, so in a sense, the Honorable Marcus Garvey was wrong that Negroes will rise to the highest in the administration of this white government as a vain hope, right? That's what some of us will, will um, that's the conclusion to which some of us would arrive, right? Again, I'm urging all of us to really maintain a, a critical scrutiny of what it means to govern, what it means to actually possess and wield political freedom and control, right? To, to have the ability to govern and to, and to um, organize political power in ways that are beneficial to your people, right? Again, is it merely participation and representation that we are after, or is it true political freedom and independence? That's, that's a, a critical question I would urge us to ask ourselves as we, as we right, engage in, in critical analysis of these various concepts. Now we have the, the arguably one of the more notable um, concepts that come from the Honorable Marcus Garvey. That's the, the Africa for the Africans um, slogan, if you will. From the text, the Honorable Marcus Garvey says, it is hoped that when the time comes for American and West Indian Negroes to settle in Africa, they will realize their responsibility and their duty. It will not be to go to Africa for the purpose of exercising an overlordship over the natives, but it shall be the purpose of the Universal Negro Improvement Association to have established in Africa that brotherly cooperation which will make the interests of the African native and the American and West Indian Negro one and the same. That is to say, we shall enter into common partnership to build up Africa in the interests of our race. This is very critical for us to understand that we are not as black people in America or in South America or in Central America, right? We are not organizing ourselves to simply move to Africa, to the continent in mass and just start building things on our own uh, accord and not in, in, as he says here, right, common partnership with those who, who currently live and occupy the African continent, right? We, 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 cannot, um, we cannot fall into the, the, the incorrect um, ways of thinking that all we need to do is, is move to Africa and, and we'll be fine. Not at all, right? It's, it's a much more uh, complex and, and, and um, in-depth issue and concept that really needs to be critically thought through, right? And, and on this same notion of Africa for the Africans, Daniel Marcus Garvey once said, I have no desire to take all black people back to Africa. There are blacks who are no good here and will likewise be no good there. So to be clear, we are not following in the footsteps in the, in the, the, the legacy, right, of the Honorable Marcus Garvey to simply hop on boats, hop on planes, and then just pull up to Africa and say, all right, you know, the, the, the African dream is upon us. No, not at all. Now, moving on to another revolutionary text. We have The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, the, the brilliant and masterful um, West Indian psychiatrist and political philosopher, right? His other notable works include Black Skin, White Masks and Toward the African Revolution. Franz Fanon is absolutely mandatory reading. Of course, all the texts that we are analyzing here are mandatory reading. Um, the Wretched of the Earth was published in 1961, and it went on to become a major influential text for future revolutionary organizing, the Black Panther Party, of course, Revolutionary Action Movement, Black Liberation Army, etc. One of the uh, cornerstone concepts of this particular text would be violence, right? Franz Fanon is, is arguably the most um, prominent um, theorist and philosopher of violence. On this, he says, spoiled children of yesterday's colonialism and of today's national governments, they organize the loot of whatever national resources exist. Without pity, they use today's national distress as a means of getting on. Does this sound, sound familiar, especially within the, the current day and age of COVID-19 and the global pandemic, right? We can see clearly who is, who is hurting, who is suffering from this global pandemic, and who is not just surviving, but actually thriving off of it, right? 
The settler-native relationship is a mass relationship. The settler pits brute force against the weight of numbers. He is an exhibitionist. His preoccupation with security makes him remind the native out loud that there he alone is master. Colonialism is not a thinking machine, nor a body endowed with reasoning faculties. It is violence in its natural state, and it will only yield when confronted with greater violence. And, and uh, to be clear, this was published in the year 1961. Again, we will see a, a if, there is, if there are no other consistencies in our analysis of these revolutionary texts, the one, consistent, the, the one consistency that remains is that of the seemingly uh, transcendent, in terms of time, messages that are delivered. We can read these excerpts and they can, they can ring so true in contemporary terms because that is the real um, product or the manifestation of that synthesis between theory and practice, that rigorous analysis of current conditions put within the context of history, right? We can see that when, when approached scientifically, that is revolution, we will see the consistencies, we will see the issues that remain prevalent across decades, across centuries, right? And, and, and again, by analyzing these texts, we will certainly see consistencies with our contemporary struggles today. Frantz Fanon goes on, he says, and it is clear that in the colonial countries, the peasants alone are revolutionary, for they have nothing to lose and everything to gain. The starving peasant outside the class system is the first among the exploited to discover that only violence pays. For him, there is no compromise, no possible coming to terms. Colonization and decolonization are simply a question of relative strength. The exploited man sees that his liberation implies the use of all means and that of force, first and foremost. We have seen that it is the intuition of the colonized masses that their liberation must and can only be achieved by force. What counts today, the question which is looming on the horizon, is the need for a redistribution of wealth. Humanity must reply to this question or be shaken to pieces by it. The third world ought not to be content to define itself in the terms of values which have preceded it. On the contrary, the underdeveloped countries ought to do their utmost to find their own particular values and methods and a style which shall be peculiar to them. The mobilization of the masses when it arises out of the war of liberation introduces into each man's consciousness the ideas of a common cause, of a national destiny, and of a collective history. Francis Fanon is one of the most brilliant thinkers in the history of humankind, point blank period. We can spend entire, uh, uh, we, can, we can spend years upon years just analyzing the rest of the earth alone. By no means um, is this one P with ABC course the end all be all in terms of that's everything you need to do to analyze France Fanon, the rest of the earth, no not at all. We are we are doing surface level uh, uh, analysis, fundamental analysis. And that isn't to say that that's, that surface level analysis is in any way uh, inferior, right, or incomplete. No, not at all. That just goes to show the real complexity, right, to, to which revolution uh, uh, exists and is, and is organized around historically, right? There are so many critical concepts that are articulated. We have the, re the redistribution of wealth, the concept of values, right? Mobilization of the masses. These are all important things that require their own individual rigorous analysis, right? Then we have the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. This was written by Kwame Nkrumah, the revolutionary Pan-Africanist and first president of Ghana, one of the greatest Pan-Africanists ever. This book is a, it is a, a multifaceted uh, tool, right? It's a diagnosis of present day imperialist and neocolonialist intervention in Africa. It examines the repressive role of racist settler minority governments. It explains why the armed phase of the African Revolution became necessary. And it advocates uh, of the coordination of policy and strategy on a continental scale.
in this book, Kwame Nkrumah argues that there are three essential components of neocolonialism. One, economic exploitation. This takes on the form known as economic aid. Then you have puppet governments, which are in, in its um, scientific term, client states. Then you have military assistance. On the notion of propaganda and psychological warfare, Kwame Nkrumah writes, throughout the struggle, we must recognize and combat enemy attempts to demoralize us. For in the face of the failure to achieve military solutions against well-organized, broadly-based guerrilla forces, as for example in Vietnam, the enemy has stepped up its efforts in the propaganda war. The aim with, with propaganda and psychological warfare is to prevent a liberation movement from getting underway by destroying it at its source, by undermining the will to fight. Where revolutionary warfare has actually begun to conquer it by political means, by granting just sufficient political, economic, and social reform to encourage all but the so-called extremists to abandon the struggle. This is a, a critical chart. In this chart, Kwame Nkrumah is, is, is putting on display the ways in which exploitation is financed on an international scale. So here we have the, the spectrum, we'll call it a spectrum, of international finance capital. On one side, you have capitalist exploitation. This is the exploitation that takes place inside a country, inside a nation. Then on, on the other end, you have imperialist exploitation. This is the exploitation that takes place outside of, of, a, of a particular nation or a country. And then with capitalist exploitation, this manifests into extreme capitalism or fascism. Then from imperialist exploitation, this manifests itself in primitive imperialism, right? Again, we are doing a fundamental analysis. I, I urge everyone who is listening to please pick up this book, to please research the thorough definitions of each of these terms, right? Because it, it requires our best in terms of time, energy, and study if we are to truly grasp these concepts, right? And then in this chart, uh, Kwame Nkrumah is, is demonstrating the spectrum between capitalism and imperialism and the ways in which they manifest themselves. It's very similar to chart number one here. So chart number three, we have capitalism taking on its manifestations of fascism and the welfare state. Within fascism, this is when the bourgeois democracy is at its minimum, and then we have the welfare state where the bourgeois democracy is at its maximum. Then from then the, the manifestations of imperialism, you have colonialism, which is crude imperialism, and then you have neocolonialism, which is rationalized imperialism. So we can think of the distinction between these two is that colonialism is, is outright exploitation. There, it's, there, nothing about it is covert or hidden or, or secret, secretive, right? It's, it's out in the open, plain to see, right? Exploitation. Neocolonialism is a lot more um, deceptive and covert and it manifests in ways that to the public eye is not detectable, right? But it's still very much a form of imperialism. Kwame Nkrumah also articulates the, the um, concept of African unity. He said that this implies that imperialism and foreign oppression should be eradicated in all their forms, that neocolonialism should be recognized and eliminated, that the new African nation must develop within a continental framework. Here we go, this is, this is critical. On socialism, Kwame Nkrumah says, at the core of the concept of African unity lies socialism and the socialist definition of the new African society. Socialism and African unity are organically complementary. He goes on to say, socialism implies common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Production is for use and not for profit. Planned methods and of production by the state based on modern industry and agriculture. Point number three, political power is in the hands of the people with the entire body of workers possessing the, listen to this, possessing the necessary governmental machinery through which to express their needs and aspirations. It is a concept in keeping with the humanist and egalitarian spirit which characterized traditional African society, though it must be applied in a modern context. All are workers and no person exploits another.
Point number four and the final point, application of scientific methods in all spheres of thought and production. To be clear, I am a socialist. I am a Pan-Africanist socialist, right? I, I am, am an improvement, right? In every sense of, of studying and following, right? The theory and the works of Kwame Nkrumah and Pan-Africanism. These four simple points of socialism articulate clearly the, um, as he says, right? The complementarity between socialism and African unity, right? Political powers in the hands of the people. Everyone works, no person exploits another. There is the, there is the use of scientific, scientific methods in all spheres of thought and production. And then we have the role of students. This is very critical, especially for those of us who are students currently, as we, as we, as we know or we may not know, the African Black Coalition organizes African Black college students. Kwame Nkrumah says, the youth belong to the revolution. Our universities, colleges, and schools in enemy held and contested zones can become centers of revolutionary protest. Students should establish close links with the workers and provide the spark needed to set in motion demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, and armed insurrection. Effective student worker cooperation can paralyze a reactionary power structure and compel change. In liberated areas, students must constantly guard and revitalize the revolution. On our youth depends the future of Africa and the continent's total liberation and unity. Moving on to the final um, text that we will analyze. This is definitely one of my favorite um, books ever. Of course, all, all of the books mentioned are some of my favorites um, to read and to study and to teach. Written by George Jackson, a revolutionary author and political theorist. He was the co-founder of the Black Guerrilla family. This book was actually finished within days of our brother's assassination by prison guards. Um, if you are not familiar with who George Jackson is, you can actually tap in to our What is Black August video on our YouTube channel, um, where we talk extensively about our brother. So one of the main uh, principles of this particular work is George Jackson's um, critique and analysis of capitalism and the ways in which it is intertwined with fascism, right? So he says, revolution within a modern industrial capitalist society can only mean the overthrow of all existing property relations and the destruction of all existing property relations and the destruction of all institutions that directly or indirectly support existing property relations. If the 1% who presently control the wealth of the, of the society maintain their control after any reordering of the state, the changes cannot be said to be, the, to be revolutionary. A revolutionary change means the seizure of all that is held by the 1% and the transference of these holdings into the hands of the remaining 99%. If the 1% are simply displaced by another 1%, revolutionary change has not taken place. He goes on to say, there could be nothing dogmatic about revolutionary theory. It is to be born out of each popular struggle. Each popular struggle must be analyzed historically to discover new ideas. We must never forget that it is the people who change circumstances and that the educator himself needs educating, going among the people, learning from the people and serving the people is really stating that we must find out exactly what the people need and organize them around these needs. It is not enough for us to simply do a lot of black history reading and then simply arrive at the conclusion that, uh, uh, okay, now I know what black people need. Let's start organizing, let's start building. If you are not in with the people, in with the masses of the people in these communities, in our neighborhoods, right? Finding out the unique needs and conditions of each neighborhood, you are doing a disservice by putting, by, by blindly organizing around problems that may not even exist in that particular community, right? It's important that we do not become uh, complacent or ignorant to the need, right, to ground ourselves and humble ourselves truthfully, right, in the service of our people. George Jackson goes on to talk about electoral politics, similar to the Honorable Marcus Garvey. He says that participation in electoral politics organized by the enemy state after recognizing that the whole process must be discredited as a conditional step into revolution and particularly participation that tends to authenticate this process is the opposite of revolution. 
He says the, the fascists already have power. The point is that some, that some way must be found to expose them and combat them. An electoral choice of 10 different fascists is like choosing which way one wishes to die. The holder of so-called high public office is always merely an extension of the hated ruling corporate class. This is critical, especially in the, the, um, the surge in propaganda of electoral politics today, right? We need to be clear, regardless of who is holding the, the who, is, who is commanding the post, right, of commander in chief, regardless of who sits in that White House, right? They are the extension of the head ruling class, right? They are a fascist in every sense of the word. George Jackson goes on, in the black colony and other depressed areas of the country, there will be less difficulty in organizing, mobilizing, and altering the attitudes of the people toward their class enemies. However, in the areas of the class structure that can be said to be, quote, making it, affecting attitudes toward a, a revolutionary change in the system of production and distribution will, of course, call for the destruction of their comfort, the manufacturing of a condition where they will be either neutral or complementary to the revolutionary effort. On prestige, prestige is a very critical concept that George Jackson uh, articulates and, and really analyzes in a way that we need to be sure we are firmly uh, understanding of. So on this, he says, Prestige stands between the masses and a revolt against their class enemy. The aura of magic, glamour, luster, and splendid permanence covers the fascists like a protective layer of fat. The, sim the slimy scales of majesty shield and conceal the, the dilapidation of the old bourgeois reign of terror. Prestige is an abstract and intangible. It has no material basis, no substantial objective reality to be perceived through the senses. One can't touch it or taste it, see it or smell it, it can't be heard. So, does, so how does it exist? Subjectively, in the mind's eye, after the fact of some connected circumstances that may have also been subjective. He goes on, the prestige of the capitalist class inside the US reached its maturity with the close of the 1860s to 1864 Civil War. Since that time, there have been no serious threats to their power. Their excesses have taken on a certain legitimacy. Through long usage, prestige bars any serious attack on power. Do people attack a thing they consider with awe, with a sense of legitimacy? If the threat to power is truly, truly revolutionary and the first step into revolutionary consciousness taken with a forceful attack upon prestige, we must anticipate reaction accept repression's terror, and meet it with a counter-terror of our own. Then there's the idea of perfect disorder. This is the enemy culture, the established government exists, first of all, because of its ability to govern, to maintain enough order to ensure that a cycle of sorts exists between various levels and elements of society. Law and order is their objective, ours is perfect disorder. Our aim is to stop the life cycle of the enemy culture and replace it with our own revolutionary culture. This can be done only by creating perfect disorder within the life cycle of the enemy culture's life process and leaving a power vacuum to be filled by our own revolutionary culture. The rise of social political institutions to their present form and complexity was not the result of chance. Oh, listen to this, this is critical. The corporation, the university, the unions, the mass media, the foundations, the associations, the courts, the prisons, the army, police, national and international, uniformed and disguised, from their beginnings were formulated as enforcers of state centralism. An examination focused on the history of all these major socio-political institutions of the United States would certainly uncover the totally economic motive underlying the foundations of these institutions. What George Jackson is doing here is brilliant and is so critical. He says that every institution within this enemy state organized within this empire around us, right? Corporations, universities, mass media, right? The prisons, the army, all of these things have a particular economic motive that reinforce hierarchy, that reinforce the, the machinations, right? Of the ruling classes, right? He goes on. 
the corporation, the foundation, the association, the mass media, the state-controlled unions, the universities, and primary schools are all designed to move people into very specifically ordered, pre-ordered, and monitored actions. The actual monitoring is done by a broader segment of the stratified slave state, but the pre-ordering is done by the one percent, by the by the one tenth of one percent ruling class and governing elite of the corporative arrangement. The purpose of these chief repressive institutions within the totalitarian capitalist state is clearly to discourage and prohibit certain activity and the prohibitions are aimed at very distinctly defined sectors of the class and race sensitized society. The ultimate ex expression of law is not order, it is prison. Please, if you have not gotten this book before, if you have not heard of this text, if you have not heard of our brother George Jackson, please, please, please do your research on him immediately. Pick up this book immediately. Study this text immediately. What he is doing here, it, it, it cannot be adequately explained in terms of its importance and its significance, not just during its time, but for all time. This is one of the most revolutionary books in the history of humankind, period. He goes on, a people without a collective consciousness that transcends national boundaries without the sense of a larger community than their own group can have no effect on history. This speaks directly to the need to, to maintain a, a to, to arrive at and to maintain a global critical awareness and a global critical consciousness, similar to what the Honorable Marcus Garvey was saying, what George Jackson is saying is, if a people does not have a consciousness that exists outside of their national boundaries, right, without a, without a connected sense to any other group, they can have no effect on history. So as long as Black people here in the United States continue to believe that we are the only Black people on the earth and that all we need to do is organize amongst ourselves and, and there's no need to connect globally, we will never have any sort of meaningful impact or effect on history. That has been PE with ABC, Analyzing Revolutionary Theory. I am the Political Education Director for the African Black Coalition, Makonan Tendaji. Please send me an email at politicaleducation at ablackcoalition.org. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, we have these books that we analyzed here um, on PDF, uh, in PDF format. So if you are interested in obtaining access to those resources, please send me an email. Um, as always, peace and black power to you all mighty Africans. Peace.